morning ma'am and students uh, welcome to sap online classes uh, today's topic is uh, umar kayam subayats and the uh, class is covered by um, sri lakshmi ar assistant professor vidya pedam uh, perimbavur college and uh, the classes will be from uh, 11 am to 12 pm and student can raise questions in the q and a section later so i welcome you ma'am to take the classes thank you thank you hello everyone how are you today i am before you to take a class on omar khayam's rubaiyat from the textbook savoring the classics described for common course english for semester 2 students of ba and bsc programs under the mahatma gandhi university before we proceed into today's class i would like to just reflect on the title of the textbook savoring the classics this is the textbook for study this is savoring the classics what do you understand by savor by savor we mean that taste to taste something and to enjoy it to the fullest we all relish beautiful things don't we just like that literature is also to be tasted to be relished and what do you understand by classic classic is anything that stands the test of time so the textbook comprises 14 lessons all taken from the classics of various genres of literature and today i am to take you to the world of omar khayyam and his rubaiyat in today's session we will be discussing omar khayyam rubaiyat and edward fitzgerald a brief introduction on the three omar khayyam is our prescribed poet rubaiyat is the work we have to study uh, and ex- a few excerpts from the work and edward fitzgerald is the one who translated the work then we'll be moving on to the four excerpts you have to study for the examination then we'll be discussing the theme later stylistics and later i'll be providing you with a couple of references for your further studies so without much ado let's talk about omar khayyam omar khayyam was a persian astronomer mathematician philosopher and poet he lived he was born in 1042 and he died in 1131 so let's discuss on omar khayyam Omar Khayyam is one of the most remarkable figures in the long intellectual tradition of Persia. He has made extraordinary contributions to the realms of mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, and furthermore literature. He composed a particular kind of poetry called Rubaiyat. Rubaiyat is a Farsi word. Farsi is an Iranian language which was spoken earlier at the time of uh, Khayyam. Its script is in Arabic uh, language. The Arabic numeral Arabic script is used for Farsi language. So Omar Khayyam composed his poetry Rubaiyat in Farsi language. That is Farsi language term for the uh, quatrain. You know. what is a quatrain a quatrain is a poem of four lines so farsi word for quatrain is rubai and the plural of i mean a multiple a number of quatrains are called rubaiyat so the title rubaiyat just means quatrains a set of quatrains a series of quatrains okay and as we know each quatrain could be considered as a separate work as a work that itself comprising an entire uh, idea as if an epigram or an or a special insight you know what an epigram is right an epigram is a short piece of work with great meaning a two lined uh, couplets are often uh, as in tirukural you know the uh, the work tirukural is composed of couplets and each couplet is very pithy and it means meaningful and has great uh, meaning in it it is really semantically significant okay khayyam owes his international reputation largely to edward fitzgerald's translation of 
Rubaiyat into English. So how do we know Omar Khayyam? We don't know Persian. I mean, not all of us know Persian language for sure. So we came to know of Omar Khayyam by, with the English translation that was made by Edward Fitzgerald. So once again, Persian astronomer, philosopher and poet, uh, he composed Rubaiyat. Rubaiyat means quatrains, a particular kind of uh, quatrains, each quatrain having its own meaning. Uh, and we know Rubai is means a quatrain and Rubai a series of quatrains. So this is the title of presentation uh, of Edward Fitzgerald's Rubai of Omar Khayyam. Uh, see, uh, on seeing the picture, I couldn't help quoting the stanza 11 of Rubai. See, a book of verses underneath the bow, a jug of wine, a loaf of bread. And thou beside me singing in the wilderness, oh, wilderness where paradise enough. In the picture, we can see a person, most probably the narrator, his beloved, we can assume so, under a tree. Uh, there is book, there is uh, perhaps uh, some liquor or coffee or something like that with him. So the, we can surely relate this particular stanza with or the quatrain or even the rubai with this image a book of verses underneath the bow a jug of wine a loaf of bread and thou beside me singing in the wilderness O wilderness where paradise enough uh, we can uh, paraphrase the meaning as like this if there is a beautiful uh, piece of literature particularly poetry and some wonderful wine to drink and a little food to eat and the company of one's beloved person, even wilderness could be turned into a paradise. Wonderful, isn't it? Yes, at this context, we should remember that Omar Khayyam was not much of a spiritual person. He believed in the Epicurean philosophy of life. We will be dealing later without much ado let us proceed to the uh, man who composed all these things into English, Edward Fitzgerald. Edward Fitzgerald was an extremely wealthy intellectual who had a passion for reading, writing and translating. Now we know that why we have an English translation of Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat, which were written in around century AD. This translation of uh, Rubaiyat is looked upon as his magnum opus and its remarkable brilliance rests over the fact that there are striking parallelisms between the philosophy of Omar Khayyam and the outlook of Fitzgerald. See, Omar Khayyam believed in uh, Epicurean philosophy. He was a hedonist. By the word hedonist, we mean that a person is uh, actually looking for pleasure like life is very short, why should we worry over? We can enjoy all the moment at present, why should we worry about what is something coming to be in future and what was there in the past? This is the uh, actual philosophy, perceptive, made use of by hedonist. Uh, when we talk about Omar Khayyam and Edward Fitzgerald, we should think about these philosophies. Nihilism is a word we should think about. Epicureanism is another concept we should think about. Then the, meaning, the meaninglessness of life, that is nihilism, as I told you. Uh, so let's proceed uh, into further discussions. Fitzgerald published Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam in 1859. And later the work was edited uh, four times. In total, Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam alone has five editions. We can compare it to fin de siècle. Fin de siècle is a French term. Okay, fin de siècle means the end of a century or the beginning of the century. The term is usually associated with uh, writings that were uh, published and written during the uh, end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. 
that period was usually associated with uh, we shall say a degeneracy and all okay so um, then Fitzgerald translated many of Chaim's quatrains and combined them into a single work with a central theme, Carpe Diem. Carpe Diem is a Latin phrase that was the central theme of the entire works of the Rubaiyat. The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam is a series, a catena, a chain of 101 quatrains. Okay, and most of the quatrains deal with this central theme of Carpe Diem. Carpe Diem means seize the day, catch the day, enjoy the moment, live in the present. These are all the things that we associate with the concept Carpe Diem. Okay, uh, we know that uh, there is no innocent translation. Every translation comes uh, apolitical, means that is there is some addition or deletion in translation. It is not always possible to translate something in a language with the same meaning and integrity as if to translate it with the other. Uh, there are great translations, sometimes at least original translations uh, may be better and in some other cases even the translation gives more currency to the original work. So, uh, after Fitzgerald published Omar Khayyam's Rubaiyat, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam in 1859, uh, many great writers read it and appreciated it. The people like Dandy Gabriel Rossetti had great words for the work. So, we should also remember that the translation of Omar Khayyam by Edward Fitzgerald not only include a purely word-to-word -word translation. It also occurred that some philosophies were paralleled, some philosophies were added. So we really have to think who Kayan was and who Fitzgerald was. At times we'll be reading Fitzgerald and at times we'll be tracing Omar Kayan. It's fortunate that both of the people, both of the great luminaries, uh, almost had a same philosophy. The book became a rage in Europe and America and retained a loyal cult following unto this day. So, I would like to take you to the first excerpt for our study. See, just a small, simple quatrain, quatrain 25. I'll decide it for you. Why? All the saints and sages who discussed of the two worlds so learnedly are thus like foolish prophets forth, their words to scorn are scattered and their mouths are stopped with dust. Once again, let's read it. Let's read the work. All the saints and sages who discussed of the two worlds so learnedly are trust like foolish prophets forth, their words to scorn are scattered and their mouths are stopped with dust. So, who are saints? Saints are spiritual persons. Sages were ancient people who had great wisdom. And what could be the two worlds uh, discussing of, discussed here? Of course, the world here and the world hereafter. What, what, what we call life and what people think of is their afterlife. I mean, after death, obviously. Then let's have a brief annotation of the work, actually. I'll read for you. Rubai 25 is one of the most representative quatrains of Omar Khayyam. The philosophy of Omar Khayyam was developed as a powerful reaction against the teachings of Islam, which was dominant religion in Persia at that time. A fundamental precept of Islam is that there are two worlds and two lives. That is why we have here two worlds. Okay, there are two worlds and there are two lives. People, individuals live in the current world 
and after death they'll be taken to another world every human being has to pass through the earthly lives and then move to the life after death every life in the world is looked upon by islam as a mere presentation and preparation of life for the next world that is the persons living in the current world are living with morality principles doctrines philosophies and what not all these things should be used to prepare themselves for the life next that was the teaching made by almost all the philosophers and spiritual leaders of the time and it was at that time our narrator our speaker questioned them with his head in his it is precisely this fundamental concept of islamic philosophy of life that is attacked by omar khayyam he admits admit that saints and sages speak learnedly about the two worlds of course saints religious persons and sages wise persons talk very authoritatively about that but have they experienced death may they dead that they really had first hand experiences on this world and the other world that is to be thought about the two worlds a world here and the world hereafter the saints and sages try to make us believe that the second world is more important than the first world omar khayyam does not explicitly say so but it is the subtext submerged at the beginning of the gospel this is what we have to infer from the uh, text it is not said directly once again uh, uh, actually you should also think about the structure of the gospel okay that is uh, the words end rhyme should be noticed how many syllables are there should be noticed these things will be discussing later okay so however saints and sages who carry out scholarly debates are ultimately declared by history as foolish prophets they may consider themselves to be learned but time looks upon them as fools the world of these saints and sages are saturated with false like learning and fake scholarships that are scattered to the world people scorn them once all these spiritual leaders are exposed to death where have their philosophies gone now just like how they spoke their words are scattered to death scattered actually they'll be filled with their mouths will be filled with dust which means Uh, after cremation people will be dead and i mean decomposed right that is what is being mentioned there the words of these saints and sages were saturated with the, these false declarations as we know one is here reminded of the oft quoted biblical passage dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return see a human being or earthly men and women Uh, being composed of the five elements they are actually being talked about various uh, in various cultures right so panjabhuda we are familiar with that uh, so bible also tells human beings are made of dust sometimes it is written sand so uh, we can draw a parallel to this however unlike the authors of the holy bible and unlike jesus christ himself omar khayyam was an out and out materialist who believed that there is nothing more real than this dust inviting a striking comparison with the practitioners of charvaka philosophy of ancient india okay in ancient india we had a, a, philo- a set of people who believed in charvaka philosophy uh, they also believed that uh, life is to be enjoyed and all okay so uh shall we move to the next excerpt the excerpt is excerpt 27 yeah 
get you the word for that? Rubai. Rubai. That is why we have Rubai. So Rubai 26. I'll just speak, uh, read, recite for you. Oh, come with old Quran and leave the wise to talk. One thing is that life lies. One thing is certain and the rest is lies. The flower that once has blown forever dies. Oh, come with old Khayyam and leave the wise to talk. One thing is certain, the life flies. One thing is certain and the rest is lies. The flower that once is blown forever dies. So, here we see the narrator referring to himself as old Khayyam. Oh, come with old Khayyam and leave the wise to talk. He says, ignore the uh, wise people. Let them talk whatever they want. Okay. And he asserts that one thing is certain that life lies. Again, he says, one thing is certain that rest is lies. So he asserts that the only thing is certain is that life flies. Life flies like a brief candle. Life is just very uh, transient. Okay. One thing is certain and the rest is lies. Everything else other than life is a mere lie. The flower that once has bloomed forever dies. So every flower born on earth, bloomed on earth, will be dead. will just wither away in no time, right? Everything beautiful just disappears in no time. We know that. That is why we remember John Keats saying, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Also, we know that momentary things really uh, are short. Remember Neruda saying, loving is, uh, I mean, uh, like it is very brief, right? And tonight I can write the saddest lines, uh, forgetting is so long, he says, right? So I'll just read. What is there in Rubai 26 for you? Rubai 26 opens with a personal touch. The poet invites the reader to come with him. He uses the third person. Yeah. He uses come with old Khayyam and live the wise to talk. He calls himself Khayyam. Of course, he calls himself his name and qualifies his name with the epithet old. Why does Omar Khayyam call, call himself old person? Why? Let's see that. The choice of the adjective demands serious attention. The poet is in fact a great mathematician, a renowned philosopher and a gifted poet. We know that, right? We see wonderful poetry he has composed for the world and for himself, obviously. This is a, de a deliberate ploy or a trick to heighten the contrast between himself, who is presented just as an old man, the wise, for always talking. See, all wise men, all uh, wisdom, all people with wisdom, all knowledgeable persons, they talk, right? And people listen to them. And now we have our speaker asking his fellow beings to come with him and leave these wise men to their own talk and their own world. The poet explains that there is only one thing that is certain, that is life lies. So the transitory nature of life is being discussed here. While the wise philosophers who are the speakers' contemporaries seem to believe, influenced by Islam, that life is a long preparation for death and life after death. Omar Khayyam seems to think that life is a brief candle. That is, the very transient nature, the very momentary nature of life is, being, uh, is brought here. This is why we call, he believes in 
the philosophy of carpe diem, uh, le, uh, carpe diem, like be merry, that is the concept. There, be happy, why worry about things to come. Then Epicurean philosophy. Epicurean is named after Epicurus, who believed that we should always be happy. Hedonist, as I told you, is another thought. Uh, hedonism is the philosophy of finding joy in everything, in every moment. That is, we can call a hedonist a pleasure seeker. All these philosophers whom Chaim was saying about have constructed an entire mythology based on what happens to one after one's death. Yeah, as I told you before, this is pure imagination of what is to come after one's death. Yet, there are great number of, there are large number of writings associated with them. The poet powerfully exposes the teachings of these wise philosophers. This rubai concludes with a beautiful metaphor of the flower. As we know, the flower represents life and in most great literature, this reference of flower for transitory nature has been there. Uh, to call from Malayalam, remember Kumar uh, Nashan's Veena Pulva. Another poem which you have just uh, studied in this semester is Loveliest Youth. There also is mentioned the transitory nature of life, particularly human life, actually. Once the flower has blown, it dies once and for all. Omar Khayyam was a keen observer of nature and a passionate lover of flowers. Many allusions to flowers, especially to roses, are there in his Rubaiyat. It is impossible for the sensitive reader to meet, miss one potent level of irony. See, here Omar Khayyam calls himself an old person, like an helpless person perhaps. Yeah, come with this old people, old man. Yeah, you leave the wise people out to their own work, their own job. But finally, there is an um, expository nature there. This old Khayyam, becomes more wise, becomes wiser than other people, than other most wise people whom other people consider wise enough. And finally, we know that these wise people whom Omar Khayyam addresses wise are just fools. This irony is very uh, clear when it comes to the matter. The poet offers himself as an old Khayyam and to his contemporary philosophers as the wise. But by the time the God train comes to an end, it is demonstrated that the poet who calls himself an old man is actually extremely wise and that the so-called wise are only fools. This rabbi can be seen as one of the supreme expressions of nihilism in world literature. So I'll just uh, read for you whatever we have discussed for this particular rubai. The rubai invites the readers to come with him. The third person is used. Then he calls himself and qualifies the term with epithet and old. The choice of the adjective demands some crucial attention. The poet is in fact a great mathematician, a renowned philosopher and a gifted poet. But he refuses to refer to any of these and instead calls himself Old Khayyam. As I told you before, this is a deliberate ploy to heighten the contrast between himself, who is presented just as an old man, and the wise who is always talking. So, as uh, we discussed, he calls life a brief cantle. That is, it life is very short. These philosophers who have constructed an entire mythology based on life and death happens to be dead one day, right? Thus, he exposes the hollowness of these teachings of the wise philosophers. So, this is one of the supreme expressions of nihilism in world literature. So, what is nihilism? We know that nihilism uh, is a philosophy, rather a doctrine, uh, which says 
about nothingness. So with this code frame, Kayan tries to say that all these vast amount of knowledge or rather mythology based upon the concept of the dead and what happens to the dead is nothing but hollow. He's just concerned about the present moment. He doesn't advocate to uh, live mystery in the present life and to hope for a better one that is in the other world, which we never know, right? I mean, at least while we are alive, if to say so. So, uh, we can talk about the next rubai, that is rubai number 27. Myself, when young, did eagerly frequent, doctor and saint, and heard great argument about it and about, but evermore came out by the same door as in I went. Once again, myself, when young, did eagerly frequent, doctor and saint, and heard great argument about it and about, but evermore came out by the same two as in I went. So we know that at the young age, we all are naturally really curious, right? Curiosity is at our peak when we are young adults, especially. So when uh, Chaim was saying, he was very curious about this world, great philosophies. He wanted to know everything. So he visited doctors. By the time doctor, we can mean just, uh, we shall say, uh, a scientist, or I mean, a you know, doctor is a wise person. Then saint, of course, we can uh, refer to spiritual people and her great uh, argument. So he listened to all the doctors and saints around him and he uh, listened to their arguments about life, about death, about everything around. But he's saying that he came out through the same door as in, let us see the brief annotation about it. Rubai 27 encapsulates the development of Omar Khayyam, the philosopher. It makes it clear that Omar Khayyam arrives at this philosophy of skepticism, nihilism, and Epicureanism after much thought, learning, and discussion. As I told you before, the three concepts we should really follow, we should really think about while discussing Khayamar, skepticism, being doubtful about things, nihilism, trying to find out the hollowness of things, and Epicureanism, uh, trying to find out a reason to be happy at every moment of life. These things, Khayyam believed in these doctrines uh, himself after much self-learning, thought, and discussion with his peers and others. The young Omar Khayyam was eager to understand the teachings of the wise and the learned. He was eager to imbibe what the philosophers had to teach him. He was very curious. He was uh, an open, a receptive child, a student, a learner who was ready, who was willing to listen to every person around him. So he made it a habit to make frequent visits to scholars, to saints, that is, he opened himself to both knowledge and to spirituality. The term doctor is used here in the traditional meaning of a doctor, a scholar. The young Khayyam entered into passionate debates with scholars and saints. So, the subject matter, uh, it cannot be denied that he was impressed by this spectacular discussion. Khayyam opened himself to every discussion offered by saints and doctors. But the young Khayyam couldn't understand why he couldn't move forward. Whatever things he heard, he could just beat about the bush and just he had to come back to the same door where he went in, which means he really couldn't reach the essence of things. 
That is why, after much thought, learning, and discussion, he changed his perspectives. He became an Epicurean. He became a hedonist. He became a nihilist. Kaim entered into the passionate debates with scholars and saints. It cannot be denied that he was impressed by their spectacular discussions. The subject matter of these extraordinarily learned discussions and debates were always the same. The doctors and the saints monstrously repeated the same arguments over and over again. He heard these same arguments again and again from both doctors and from saints. He hopes for knowledge and enlightenment, but neither does he get those things. Neither the saints nor the sages are able to provide him the knowledge that he looks for. But he was badly mistaken. He always came out by the door through which he had gone in. Thus, it became strictly clear to him that the teachings of the doctors and the saints were all a much ado about nothing. We needn't listen much to these doctors and saints because they didn't offer what he was looking for. This is what we understand from that particular rabbi. But he was badly mistaken, I told you that. The Omar, this Omar Khayyam was inexorably and inevitably led to a philosophy that rejects all philosophies and has made him one of the greatest philosophers. Imagine the irony about it. He rejects every philosophy about philosophy and he himself is considered one of the greatest philosophers in the world. So, uh, we can now proceed into the fourth Rubai we have to study. That is Rubai 28. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow, and with my own hand labored it to grow. And this was all the harvest that I reaped. I came like water, and like wind I go. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow, and with my own hand labored it to grow. And this was all the harvest that I, I came like water and like wind I go. So here we have a metaphor of a harvest. We see the seed of wisdom. We see a hand laboring it to grow. Then we see him reaping his harvest. This is one of my personal favorite uh, quotes by Cotrins by Khayyam. For you, the annotation goes like this. Rubai 28 can be read as a comprehensive overview of life work of the great philosopher of Omar Khayyam. He lived in Persia in the 11th and 12th centuries and became a highly respected mathematician, philosopher, and poet. We have already known that fact. He was something of a cult figure who had numerous followers, students, and admirers. His teachings went against dominant philosophies of the time, but gained tremendous acceptance among his own followers. The poet explains that he sowed the seed of wisdom with them. As I told you, sow seed of wisdom. That is an imagery from harvest, I mean farming actually. Then, who is referred to by the speaker as them? We should think about that. Listen here. The second word of the first line, them. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow. So he uh, made use of the support from other people around him. His admirers, his followers, his students, his fellow beings, everyone. Who is referred to by them? Let's see who they are. He did not merely sow the seed of wisdom. He, it is obvious that the poet has his followers in his mind and he speaks of them. As I told you, them could mean the followers, the admirers, the learners of Khayyam. 
he also worked hard to make these seeds of wisdom grow better. He not only did sow the seed of wisdom, but he made it a point to see that he really worked well to reap it. So, what was the ultimate result of this intellectual and philosophical process undertaken by the speaker? He, he had some uh, seeds of wisdom, then he made it grown and he reaped some harvest. What could be the harvest, harvest he actually reaped out of them? He heaped the harvest and the harvest was the philosophy taught by him was fully imbibed by his followers. If my audience listening to me now gets something out of this session, if you happen to get anything new from these four excerpts, then naturally my harvest would be that. Just like that, Omar Khayyam's harvest was that his doctrines were fully imbibed by his scholars. The last line of the rubai encapsulates the soul of the philosophy of Omar Khayyam. I came like water and like wind I go. So we know that we come to the mother earth simply and we leave nothing but air. So like water I came and like wind I go. This seemingly simple line has infinite semantic profundity. The poet says that he came like water and that like wind he will go. What the poet states is not merely about himself. It is a dictum that has a universal appeal. Every human being come like water and every human being, sorry, uh, goes like a wind. We don't know where we come from and we don't know where we go. We bring nothing with us and we take nothing with us. Most importantly, we leave nothing behind. The entire hum saga of human existence is here summarized using just two elements, water and wind. Ultimately, after death, the body is turned into elements. If there is one word that can capture the essence of existence, it is a world, nothingness. So here I am bound to quote Alfred Lord Tennyson and his line from The Lotus Eaters. Death is the end of life. Ah, why should life or labor be? I repeat, death is the end of life. Ah, why should life or labor be? If we are, to, it means if we are to die one day, why should we work so hard? Why should we toil and toil too much? Why can't we enjoy the simple things of joy that surround us? So, as we have already discussed the four core trains, we would like to uh, summarize what we are discussing here so far. Topic DM. As I told you before, is a Latin phrase meaning seize the day or catch the day. So, carpe diem and transience, I'm so sorry, there's a spelling mistake there. It is uh, no C there. I'm so sorry about it. So, there you have to uh, strike off the C, okay? The word is now right. Uh, okay. So, there is only transience of life. Sorry about that again, one second. The themes we have discussed so far were the transitory nature of life and the carpe diem, the philosophy of uh, enjoying life to the fullest. And now let's discuss the stylistics of the work. Uh, as I told you before, this is a catena of a chain of uh, 101 chord trains. There are 101 rubai in the rubai, the former Khayyam. There's a perfect dovetailing of the thematics and the stylistics in uh, this magnum opus of Omar Khayyam. That is, the themes are wonderfully uh, 
mingled, interwoven with beautiful intrinsic patterns of poetry. Every code train, almost every code train displays a golden liquidity. A person with a set of attitudes, with a set of perceptions, with a set of experiences, with a set of uh, philosophy or doctrines, may see one code train in one particular light, which may be different to another person with all different sets of light. So each code train of Omar Khayyam has a quality of itself. It has a liquidity. The meaning can be changed for each person. There is nothing final. That is why we say every code train has a golden liquidity. The diction used is simple and appropriate. We need to open a dictionary to find out the meaning of every word we have discussed so far. Did we? That's why the diction was that simple. Every simple person without much, much knowledge in English language can come across, read, and enjoy Kayam Rabai. The rhyme scheme is A A B A. As I told you, the rhyme scheme is A A B A. That is, when we have four lines. For example, I'll be reading you uh, the last one. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow, and with my own hand labored it to grow, and this was all the harvest I reaped. I came like water and been like wind I go. So there are four lines, which means every word ends with a rhyme, okay? So, uh, so grow, and go are A. The first, uh, the last words of the four lines I'll be saying for you once again. So, grow, reach, go. A, A, B, A. This is how we find the rhyme scheme of a poem. So, every chord train has this rhyme scheme. A, A, B, A. And there is iambic pentameter in the poem. That is, each chord train is written in iambic pentameter. That is, the two lines would compose ten syllables. Just check that. With the seed of wisdom did they sow, and with my own hand labor it to grow. So we can count the number of feet. A feet will be considering a feet consists of two syllables, and the iambic pentameter means that there are five metrical feet where a stressed, uh, an unstressed syllable is followed by a stressed syllable. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow. That is why with, with is unstressed, them is stressed. You got it, right? So the imagery is very powerful and there is linear parity. By linear parity, we, means that, we mean that almost of the same length. We know each rubai where was four in lines and each line had almost a similar length. So these are a couple of sites uh, you can refer to and I will just now stop for questions. One student asked one question uh, to elaborate uh, that uh, lampic pentameter. Okay, fine, fine. Thanks. Iambic pentameter is the meter. Okay. We know that there is rhythm and meter in English language. There are um, mostly there are five. I am uh, dactyl, anapest, and etc. Iambic pentameter refers to one particular meter. There, where an unstressed syllable is followed by a stressed syllable. Okay, um, we shall say. Okay, we you know what a syllable is, right? So a syllable is uh, a puff, what is uttered in a single puff of air. Uh, I hope you uh, I hope you understand. Okay, one question uh, uh, regarding this came here to my private chat also. Include stylistics in a fifteen mark questions. So I'll be uh, clubbing these two things together. It would be better if you can include these stylistics uh, there in your essay. Because uh, at the undergraduate level, we expect a learner not only to summarize what is 
being mentioned in the textbook. We would try to see if he or she can get the stylistic notions too. So I'll just come back to the question. Iambic pentameter means a couplet written in five metrical feet. Each feet will be having two syllables. So every syllable will be counted and there would be 10 syllables and the first syllable would be a weak one and the second syllable would be a stronger one. Uh, I shall uh, explain with the some example of our textbook itself. The final rubai, that is rubai number 28 we have discussed was with them, okay, to uh, recite it, with them the seed of wisdom did I sow and with my own hand labored it to grow. To consider iambic pentameter, we should split these lines into small, small, small units with each syllable. So when we split the first line, the syllables are with them, the seed of wisdom did I sow. These are the 10 syllables. Okay. So each line is written with five feet and 10 syllables. With them. With is unstressed. Them comes a bit stressed. That is how the rhythm works. The first syllable is unstressed and the second syllable is stressed. With them the seed of waste did I so this comes. This is how the rhythm occurs and that's how we calculate um, the metrical stressed and unstressed things and that's how we can say that's an iambic pentameter. Hope you're clear. Um, any language teacher would uh, help you uh, with that. I hope, if not clear with this. Okay, uh, hope I have time for another question. The one is, shall I proceed, Rashid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Does restless lies mean everything in life other than life is worthless? According to this particular philosophy, yes, we should mean so. That is, he believes in nihilism, as I told you before. Nihilism means there is nothingness. As I have, uh, as you uh, rightly remember, you should think about the literatures that flourished after the two World War time. You should remember waiting for Godot. What is the communication there? What is the explanation? Nobody comes, nobody goes, right? That is some uh, meaninglessness is celebrated. Just like that, here, our narrator, our speaker of the poem, he calls himself Khayam there. He says, rest is lies. The only thing is life flies. That life is a brief candle that would be burning bright, but shortly uh, will vanish its existence. Hope I'm clear to you right now. What is the difference between old Khayam and young Khayam? Visiting wise in 26 and 27 questions, the quatrains. That's nice. When we say the old Kaya, there uh, the speaker tells about, uh, calls himself old, so as to say the futility of the teachings of the wise, the proclaimed so called wise uh, scholars. Wise scholars have al already been saying too much things about things what they don't know. But in the young uh, Kaya, yeah, 27. Myself when young did eagerly frequent. The young Kaya was too curious. He was a curious kid, curious learner, curious adult who wanted to know things about life. So the young Kaya is an inquisitive learner and the old experienced Kaya is one who knows the nothingness described in the philosophies of other so-called wise scholars. Ma'am, one question. Is yeah, there any allegorical reference in the work? Uh, in the work yeah. as such, there is. Actually, in these four references, uh, yeah, I would suggest you to read uh, the one 
Omar Khayyam, I mean, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam published in 1859. That's available in the website. I would like to suggest that uh, the Omar Khayyam's, uh, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam uh, by uh, Edward Fitzgerald published in 1859. That's available online. Actually, there you have every allegorical reference for every Rubaiyat. Okay, not only these uh, particular four, every Rubaiyat. So if you see there is allegorical references, if there is, because when we say that uh, mouths are stopped with dust, we refer to Chavaga philosophy, we refer to uh, Panjabhuda, we refer to uh, biblical passage of dust, uh, sand and all. Yes, there is. Uh, for better uh, explanations, for further explanations, you can check this particular edition of uh, the Rubaiyat by Omar Khayyam, where Fitzgerald himself offers all the allegorical and literary allusions uh, mentioned so far till his time. Okay. And another thing here we have is Epicurean um, philosophy. Yeah. Epicurean philosophy is about uh, living life to the fullest. That is enjoy everything positive possible in life. Eat, drink and be merry is the meaning of epicureanism that is we just we live we enjoy we have wonderful food and that's it there is nothing more spiritual in it epicureanism refers to a lavish a splendid life i got another question from shridika so why are certain words capitalized at random like words mouths dough and so on because they are not just those words they have some metaphorical significance. When we say words, those words just don't mean immediate words as those I have just offered you right now. They mean words of philosophies. Uh, to quote Hamlet, when in Shakespeare's Hamlet, there is an occasion when Laertes father Polonius asks Hamlet, what are you reading? Hamlet's answer is words, words, words. Of course, we read words, of course, we say words, but these words do contain much more significance than what they normally see. And uh, mouths, of course, uh, like it is not only the organ mouth, it is about the person, it is used as a metonymy perhaps. Metonymy means uh, a representation of a person. A wise person saying something could be called mouth there. Dust, of course, what we are composed of. Uh, door, it is not just a particular wooden door. The door there means the path through which the author there reached there, and the same path where he is coming back without getting enlightened. Uh, one more question here. Yes, please. The difference between water and wind in the poem, or connection with life apart from Panjabuda. Apart from Panjabuda, that's nice. Okay, so, uh, okay, see, uh, there is in Indian philosophy, Indian culture, Eastern philosophy as such, for that matter, every culture, water is used for all purifying purposes. I mean, not just cleansing out the dirt around us, like as we do in break the chain campaign or washing us and our hands and protecting ourselves from COVID-19. It is different. Water from the birth of a child till the cremation of a person. In almost every uh, religious aspect, water is used. Okay. So the connection between water and wind and Panchabhuda is obviously mentioned. Uh, what is not being mentioned is about, apart from uh, these aspects in Eastern philosophy, there are lots and lots of things. See, it is the breath that sustains a person. A person is no more when he doesn't breathe. That same breath could be called as wind. How silently the wind comes, silently or, I mean, physically we are not aware of the wind. We can we can't. Uh, we just experience experience the wind. We don't uh, see the wind as such. We just 
see the things wind uh, makes us feel right so water water is there in every aspect when we are born also uh, of course water uh, water is there like how the fluidity of water is is reminded of how a person comes how uh, how the, the the nature and the birth the, the spontaneity the fluidity uh, that you know shape that there is no particular shape right so it is that natural we are unaware of how it comes we are unaware of where the person is coming from it you know, the person doesn't bring anything of his own that is why uh, spontaneous like water and like wind he goes means uh, we just like how a uh, wind comes uh, without making us aware about it we just disappear we just stop living by exhaling the last trace of wind we had that's what i can say at least is wise men fools before death also as per the speaker yes that is how we should say it because it is that irony uh, what makes sense say about uh wise men i just caught the line one second to get the uh, essence of it oh come with all khayam and leave the wise khayam calls himself old but the other people wise because he wants to expose the foliness of these wise men and of course they are they could be considered fools before that because if they were not fools enough they would have been alive now because they have written so much about death without knowing what death is directly yes okay ma'am thank you thank you for your valuable session and thank you students so we are binding up the session here thank you thank you all thank you very much asaf for giving me this opportunity to interact with undergraduate students of mahatma gandhi university thank you very much i thank each and everyone who have associated with me so far thank you very much